Good morning, everyone, and good evening to those of you who are following us, not from Asia, but from the United States. Uh, my name is Andrea Minsky bigazzi and I have the pleasure and the honor of being the coordinator of Privacy Rules. Privacy Rules is a global alliance of uh, legal and cybersecurity experts dealing with privacy from A to Z, 360 degrees on any element, any issue you might have and companies might have when it comes to the collection, processing, transfer, transfer and deletion of data. Um, Privacy Rules and its members, in fact, provide multi-subject and multi-jurisdictional and multifaceted advice and de on data privacy, legal and technical solutions to any company, institution or organization that sees the collection and processing of data as a relevant part of its business. Today, we are discussing about data transfers within Greater China and from Greater China to and with the United States. This is obviously a very important topic, undoubtedly, as between these two regions, there is notoriously a very substantial part of the global business. So who are our panelists? Today we have Jihong Chen, who is a partner, equity partner at Zhonglung, a law firm in China. Um, and Jihong kindly accepted also to be the moderator of this panel. We have Pojek Walsh, who is partner at Tanner De Witt, a law firm in Hong Kong. We have Jose Leitao, who's a partner at MDME Lawyers in Macau. John Eastwood, partner at Iger Law in Taiwan. And finally, Michael Neitardi, who follows us with, from the United States, who is a member of Frost Brown Todd in, in the States. The topic that we are going to discuss are very interesting today. Jihong will immediately address us with what the draft personal information protection law in China uh, does when it comes to soliciting comments in this moment and the, the, the new uh, in the impact that it will have on cross-border tra data transfers. Um, Podrick will discuss about data transfers from and to Hong Kong which seem uncomplicated on the surface, but quite complex in reality once you scratch the surface. John will elaborate on Taiwan's history, which has led to a system that's seemingly easy to comply with, but has tough penalties if you violate the data privacy uh, regulations. Jose will also address us on the monetization and transfer of data under the Macau data privacy law. And uh, we will learn from, from Mike that although no federal or state laws in the United States currently restrict the companies transferring data from Greater China into the US, businesses should still be aware of the current regulatory regimes that might impact their business processes. I will not take much of your time anymore. I just invite everyone in the audience to follow us on www.privacyrules.com and also to connect to our LinkedIn page where we provide constantly um, constant updates on our activities. So the word goes now to our panelists. Thank you very much, Ji Hong, for accepting being here with us. And the word is yours. Okay, thank you, Anto. And uh, I'm Ji Hong Chen and is a partner of Zhong Law Firm. And Zhong Law Firm is one of the first law firm headquartered in Beijing and with branch offices around the world. And uh, I and pr practice uh, 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 data protection and also cyber security. Uh, so you may know that uh, in the October, Chinese National People's Congress uh, released the draft personal information protection law. And it is quite an important law. And uh, after the effectiveness of the draft and uh, this law and the data security law and the cyber security law will become the three pillars is a legal regime of uh, cyber, cyberspace administration and uh, the data protection. Uh, this law actually uh, stipulated certain basic principles of personal information processing and the uh, legitimacy and purpose limitation, the minimum of uh, scope and openness and uh, transparency, accuracy, accountability, and uh, personal information security. Compared with the principle of GDPR, we may realize that uh, each counterpart of GDPR can find, uh, can find in the draft. And so we, we, we can conclude that uh, 
the drop law of China is quite similar with the principles of GDPR. And the draft does not include the right to data portability in draft. I think it is, it is reasonable to consider and the current situation in China. This draft actually also uh, stipulate multi-legal basis for personal information processing. As we know that China uh, promulgated the first uh, uh, cyberspace law and named uh, cyber, cyber security law in 2017. And in the cyber security law, the only legal base for data processing is consent. And after the effectiveness of the cyber security law and it is many uh, dispute and it is very controversial. But after the civil code and the law actually expand the legal basis for the, uh, uh, for the for the data processing. In draft, uh, actually, there's a few uh, legal basis. They are the consent and also the uh, contract uh, entering into or performing contract need or performing the st statutory responsibility or obligation and responding to public health emergency. And this very related to the current the pandemic and in, uh, during the pandemic that to collect the information for the uh, health handling, it is quite important. So in draft, we add as a public health emergency need of public for protecting, protecting the life, health of property safety of nature person in emergency situation. And also we recognize the base of uh, public uh, interest, such as for the news reporting and public uh, opinion supervision uh, within the reasonable scope of processing and also the circumstance are stipulated by laws and regulation. It is all in one and terms. It comes with um, and, uh, GDPR, I think that the only significant difference we, we in the draft does not recognize the base of uh, the legitimate interest. And uh, um, because of the uh, difficulties in, 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 in implementation of the legitimate interest. And when you enforce legitimate interest, it need a balanced test between the data subject interest and the data controller interest. It is meet, meet some weaker areas and difficulties. So any person that the draft does not include the, the legitimate interest in the draft, we can understand the, the behind the logic. But in the draft, we have um, all in one and uh, other circumstances as stipulated by laws and regulations. Uh, one thing is very unique and draft. We request um, separate or writing consent and some uh, and some uh, scenarios. When the processor provides a personal information to third party, when the processor may publish a personal information, and when personal imaging and personal identity the characteristics information uh, collected uh, device in public place may be made public or provide to other persons. And or when the processing involves sensitive personal information or the processor may provide the personal information outside of China. And these scenarios are separate consent may be uh, required to secure from the data subject. It were unique and uh, uh, this Sub is separate uh, consent is still and a very uh, hot dispute in China. Um, go back to the cross border transfer and after the uh, effecting the state of uh, cyber security law in China and the cross border transfer is also the the the, uh, the concern for many multi multinational company uh, having business in China. Uh, actually, before the draft, we have no uh, clear uh, guidance for the uh, cross-border data transfer. But in draft, in uh, uh, the draft gives actually three ways for the conducting the cross-border data transfer. Uh, they are the first uh, security assessment for the CIO. If CIO want to uh, transfer the data collected in China to oversee and uh, they so pass the security assessment organized by the, the government. And uh, the government is a CEC, Cyberspace Administration of China. 
And for the normal business, if the score of the information processed is up to the amount specified by CEC and such a transfer into part of security assessment by the CEC. And this is the first legal way for the cross-border data transfer. The second legal way is a personal information protection certification. And if the data, uh, data transferring party uh, having taken the personal information protection certification conducted by the professional agencies approved by the government. And this is a legal way for the cross-border transfer. And the third way is um, contract. And the uh, sending party and the leasing parties uh, and into a contract and stipulating the obligations for both parties. At the same time, the sending parties need to supervise the um, use of the processing activities by the leasing party. And the, this can use the ways of a uh, 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 contract. And this um, contract way is what we, we, we is quite similar with uh, uh, the SEC and the GDPR. Uh, and and uh, beside the three legal ways, there's um, OIN one, otherwise stipulated by laws and the federal regulation of the state, uh, state uh, cyberspace authorities. So it is a key point for the for the uh, draft personal information protection law uh, and. Uh, as you know, in China, for legislation of one law, it adopts three readings. And it's just the first reading. We need to pass the, uh, the, the other two readings. We, uh, I predict that uh, the law may be uh, promulgated uh, into force uh, in next year and in 2021. Uh, it is very spe speedy. OK, it is just my, um, my brief about the law. Jihong, thank you very much. This is uh, also very useful for our audience to, to see this, this comparative chart. I think it was really, really educative. Um, so we can, we can move in, this, in, this, um, in, the, in the moderation phase and, uh, okay. and possibly starting with the, with the questions that certainly are, uh, will be very, very interesting for all our panelists. Thank you. OK, thank you. So first question to the Pat Riga, and uh, who, is, who is also the chair, chairman of the Private Rules Know-how and Training Committee. Uh, uh, as you know that uh, Hong Kong is uh, SER of China, but with a very uh, quite different uh, legal system. So my question is, what is the required, required and the Hong Kong personal data privacy laws in respect uh, of personal data transfer outside of Hong Kong? This is uh, actually one of the interesting points, Ji Hong, is, is that if you look uh, around the screens that are on today's presentation, uh, we have uh, Jose from Macau, myself from Hong Kong, and, and you uh, in, in Beijing. And the three of us are within China, uh, but each of us uh, practices in a different jurisdiction. Uh, so within Hong Kong, Hong Kong looks at transfers from Hong Kong uh, to any other jurisdiction in much the same way. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a curious thing in the sense that if you were to look at the personal data privacy ordinance, there is a framework in there which is quite similar to what people might be familiar with uh, under GDPR, uh, which is a framework which would uh, allow for assessments of jurisdictions for adequacy or for other means of protecting personal data upon a transfer, you know, through contractual means and so forth. Um, and it, it's, it's section 33 in our, in our ordinance, and it's, it's been on the statute book since 1996, and it is yet to be brought into force. So it is not actually law in force within Hong Kong. Uh, so the, what that means in respect of personal data transfer from Hong Kong to other places is that it depends on the uh, nature of the consents uh, that you have in place at the point in time or the information that you've given to data subjects at the point in time that you're, you're collecting the personal data and then the purpose for which you're transferring it. Uh, and I'll explain that a little bit more. Uh, Hong Kong operates under a principle of infor informed, informed um, gathering of personal data. So with the data subject, you let them know 
the personal data that you're collecting it, why you need it, the purposes for which you're going to use it, and the classes of persons you're going to transfer uh, the personal data to. And the, that information impresses the trail right through in respect of the uh, data life cycle in terms of how that data, uh, personal data is subsequently used. So if you say it's going to be used for particular purposes, uh, that also is something that would bind the classes of personal data transferees. So when you transfer the personal data, even though that the transferee is going to use the personal data uh, independently and in their own right, uh, they can only do so for the original purposes that were informed of the data subject in Hong Kong. Now, if you move that to a, a slightly higher standard uh, where you're dealing with a person who is going to take uh, personal data from the person who's collected it and process it on their behalf. Uh, there you have a whole range of requirements around personal data security, mm -hmm. cybersecurity, making sure that the information always remains uh, secure and uh, uh, capable of not being uh, unauthorized access and so forth. Um, but also uh, other obligations in respect of the use for which the data processor may use the personal data. So they can only use it for the purpose for which the processing is, is being conducted, and then they must destroy that personal data or return it as soon as that activity is completed. So within that, you have something of a hybrid in the sense that there is a, a greater degree of freedom within Hong Kong in respect of international personal data transfers, because it doesn't yet follow the kinds of uh, protocols that would apply, for instance, under GDPR and similar international form uh, legislations ar around uh, personal data transfer. But at the same time, there is a, a rather robust set of rules around the information you give to data subjects in, in relation to the purpose for which their personal data may be used, and then how that is tracked through uh, the data life cycle in terms of uh, uh, people who, uh, to whom that personal data is transferred or how that personal data is processed in other locations. So that's a, a quick snapshot in respect of the position within Hong Kong. Okay, uh, thank you, Patrick. It is quite uh, pinpointed. And, and uh, let's, let's move to the Taiwan and uh, the question to John. Uh, John and uh, to you, uh, what is required in the Taiwan's Personal Data Protection Act for international data transfer head out from Taiwan, John? Well, the good news is that, to a large extent, um, you know, the, the uh, Personal Data Protection Act, or as we call it PDPA, uh, is uh, fairly loosey-goosey and fairly easy to comply with. The uh, regulatory authorities have not really clamped down very much, particularly with regards to transfers to uh, the United States and most of the rest of the world. Um, Article 21 of the PDPA allows for the possibility of industry regulators to impose restrictions um, where there's a major national interest or where there's national security issues or where it's required under a treaty. Uh, but in general, uh, you know, Taiwan doesn't really have any history of blocking it with the one exception within the greater China region. Uh, so among the public sectors, only the uh, NCC and the FSC, which would be like the, uh, the communications and uh, financial uh, branches, uh, sections of the government, um, have been restricting cross-border transfer uh, between Taiwan and the PRC. And that's despite the fact that there's, uh, you know, billions and billions of dollars of business being done every day, and despite the fact that, uh, uh, you know, approximately 5% of uh, the population of people uh, who have a Taiwan passport are um, working and living or running businesses uh, within the PRC. Um, but you know, to this time, now that's the two sectors where it's, it's a little bit tough within greater China. In terms of uh, it transfers out to the rest of the world, Thailand's actually very easy to get along with. Okay, thank you. Thank you, June. And the uh, next question is to Hosi, and Hosi is from uh, Macau SER. Uh, Hosi, uh, can you introduce our, uh, the core issues related to the monetization and transfer of data and the Macau data privacy law. Good morning, Ji Hong. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for uh, for having me here today. Good morning to all the, the attendees and the rest of the panel. Um, 
as you know, more and more, and with the particular circumstances of this moment, personal data and the, and the ability for it to flow and to flow to some extent in the service of business is, um, is, go, is, going, is, is and is going, is going to be of paramount uh, importance. I would say having heard Podrick uh, on the Hong Kong side and, uh, and having heard John on the Taiwan side, I would say that Macau would lie somewhere in between. Uh, in the sense that it has a framework of protection um, and, uh, and the regulator is becoming um, more adept at regulating and at uh, applying sanctions and, uh, and ensuring that things are, are done by the book. But it's still a relatively straightforward and easy process. And um, uh, the, the main features are, and not, not unlike Ji Hong, the presentation that you made of the new PRC law, the uh, the main features are very much related with uh, with consent and with purpose. I think those are the two main frontiers of uh, being able to use personal data for uh, for the, uh, some commercial purposes. And uh, and the other main aspect is, and we'll we will get into this uh, a bit later, is the regulatory notifications that have to be made under Macau law for the data to be lawfully collected and transferred here. Um, there is no whitelist under Macau law, which means that we either have to go through a path of assessment of, su of suitability of the jurisdiction, or we can just set aside that, uh, that, uh, that assessment altogether, assume that, that the, the target jurisdiction does not have the same level of protection as Macau. And in that case, there will be a number of requirements that have to be met and that we can go into it a bit later. So. I guess the core themes of both commercial usage and transfer of data to outside outside of Macau would be related to consent, would be related to purpose, would be related to the degree on which this information is given to the data subjects at the time of collection, very much like like Podrick emphasized for Hong Kong, and finally would be would um, a major theme would be the compliance with the regulatory notifications for transfer. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the comments. And I, I understand that the key opponent is that uh, you need to conduct the jurisdiction by jurisdiction assessment regarding where the, the cross border transfer. Uh, next question to Mike. Uh, all of us may realize that realizing the increasing tension between China and the US in the past two years. But at the same time, we cannot ignore the fact is that uh, China and US are still the the most important players in the, the world in terms of economy and in terms of uh, the, uh, the politics. Uh, someone is talking about a totally uh, decoupling between two countries, but I think that the uh, total decoupling is impractical. We still have very strong, uh, strong ties in the economic areas. Mike, uh, what regulation might impact the transfer of data from Greater China into the US? Ji Hong, thank you very much for having me, and I, I agree with you uh, completely. Um, and, and that's a great question. Right now, uh, for the most part, except in situations involving public or governmental agencies, um, in the United States is not limiting the flow of data either into or out of the United States right now. Um, and having said that, uh, the United States Federal Trade uh, Commission is the U.S. agency charged with protecting uh, free and fair trade, and also protecting consumers. Um, and, and with that in mind, it does this through investigating allegations of unfair or deceptive trade practices or trade acts. And the alleged unfair or deceptive trade practice can include public statements uh, from a company about how it is securing data, transferring data, treating data, privacy policies, all of that. Um, so, so what the, the FTC will do, even though there's no specific uh, law that relates to this area, the FTC has kind of made itself um, the, the federal government agency that will uh, investigate alleged uh, unfair or deceptive trade practice acts. Um, and so because of that, a company can get itself into trouble um, if it has a public statement about its company's compliance with privacy regimes that doesn't fit reality. For instance, uh, the FTC in the past has investigated and levied fines against companies that falsely claimed that they were compliant with the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation 
uh, cross-border privacy rules. Uh, there were some companies in, in the past that the FTC saw were making public statements about their compliance with that regime that were not so, so the FTC investigated them and then uh, it levied fines uh, to those companies. So the take home here is that although there are no current laws restricting uh, data transfer into the US, the FTC will still take action against companies that misrepresent to their, their customers how they are treating or securing that data. And in other words, um, if, if a company says that they're treating the data one way, but in actuality you're treating it another way, the FTC may step in and investigate and levy a fine. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, yeah, I know that the FTC is very, quite active in, in investigating the, the data, the related cases. And that move, move to uh, Hong Kong again, and question to Pat Rick. And uh, based on my experience that uh, many multinational companies having business in Asia may uh, select Hong Kong as the ideal place for the, their data, data center. So, so why is that? Are there any challenges to that continuing, Pat Rick? Well, what's interesting about this question, Ji Hong, is, is that we're, you know, it moves the conversation to a broader sense of data than just personal data alone. And once you do that, within Hong Kong, you'll find that there is free flow of data. Uh, and of course, as anyone in the IT community will know, it's when data moves that data makes money. So the, the policies around allowing a free flow of data is really, really important in respect of the vibrancy of an ICT uh, environment and economy. So within Hong Kong, there are a number of compelling reasons why it has traditionally been one of the two Asian hubs in respect of data centers, the other being Singapore. Um, a lot of that is, is that it is, uh, it's a very ICT enabled place. So there's a, a, a big penetration in respect of uh, fiber optic, optic cabling. Uh, which means that the speed of transmission is well, as fast, if not faster, than any place as a, as a corollary uh, within Asia. Uh, also, in respect of the availability of electricity, it's virtually at 100%. I mean, the, um, so you've got an available uh, electricity supply at a comparatively low tariff by Asian standards. Uh, with the speed of transmission, that means that there's very, very low latency in respect of transmission of uh, of data and of information. And if you ally that with a, a, a government policy that is very focused upon making uh, land grants to facilitate data centers being constructed, and with a government unit that then allows uh, and fast tracks through planning permissions in order to rehabilitate buildings so that they're suitable to be converted to data centers, uh, you've got an environment and an infrastructure that is very, very much uh, suited towards, you know, uh, the, the, the you setting up a data center and use of data center facilities, and that's been used and exploited for a number of years. And uh, it, uh, you know, over the years, Hong Kong has very much been at the uh, center within, at the top within Asia in respect of being a data center hub. Now, there aren't anything on or any challenges as such on the horizon to that in respect of the basic infrastructure that I've laid out. Uh, there aren't any particular restrictions that are being proposed in respect of the free flow of information. We've already spoken about the transfer of personal data, uh, where it's a, it's a process that is very fairly straightforward to navigate in respect of data transfer requirements. I think one of the changes that, uh, that might come in the, for in the future is, is just a you know, on that geopolitical level, where if you've got tensions maybe between uh, China and the US, where there may be some degree of um, uh, reluctance in respect of using uh, someplace that is within the country of China, even if it is within a different jurisdiction and within a different system, uh, there has been some uh, concern expressed about that and some movement away from data centers in Hong Kong, uh, particularly within uh, the media sector uh, and areas where there is a feeling that there may be particular levels of uh, you know, uh, state secret information and so forth. So there is some retrenchment in those areas, but within 95% of the economy as we know it, you can expect that Hong Kong's primacy as a data center hub in Asia is likely to continue.
Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Parikh. Uh, let's see that uh, where there's uh, any changes between the uh, China and the US relation, uh, it, it affects many aspects. As, as we know that uh, uh, the transfer between China, uh, between Hong Kong, SER, and the mainland China is considered as a uh, cross-border transfer and need to follow the procedures for the cross-border transfer. And uh, the government of uh, uh, Hong Kong, SER, is seeking a special treatment from the central government. And if uh, the transfer between China, uh, mainland China and Hong Kong is regarded as uh, domestic transfer. And I think that uh, this will facilitate Hong Kong to be the harbors and uh, of the data centers in future. Uh, let's move to Taiwan. As we uh, may uh, see, uh, 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 see that uh, Taiwan too has become a massive center for data with Google having three data harbors in Taiwan uh, and Microsoft announcing and um, it is a construction of data center in, in, in Taiwan. Uh, so, so John, what is behind that? Well, you know, one thing is that, uh, you know, when I first came to, to uh, Taipei, you know, 20 years ago or so, the undersea cables were just starting to come in. Uh, and, you know, the development of that is just, you know, absolutely shocking. As I started looking at it more and more, I realized uh, just how many have been added and, uh, you know, for various reasons, there's been a lot of uh, effort uh, to fund the addition of new cables coming in and out of Taiwan, um, which have connected it very well within the region and you know across the Pacific. Uh, Google has uh, cited to Taiwan's position as a uh, major high-tech hub. I mean, it already has a very mature um, you know, set of other technologies and companies that would use that. Um, uh, it's got very reliable infrastructure in terms of power generation. And a lot of the uh, data centers, uh, when, when they power their servers, they want to have renewable energy. And Taiwan's had a very big commitment in on that. Uh, I know that's, you know, especially with global warming, that's a big issue around the world. Um, but in terms of the availability of solar and wind, and now uh, currently uh, being developed as offshore wind, um, those are big attracting uh, factors for some of these uh, uh, but another issue is also this, uh, this, this kind of issue between U.S. and China. Uh, earlier this year, the U.S. Uh, FCC approved Google to use a U.S. Taiwan undersea cable, but then banned the section, which Google and Facebook had partly funded between the U.S. and Hong Kong out of national security concerns. Um, uh, but in truth, the, the main reason for its growth would be, you know, there's a cheap, uh, local uh, stable electric uh, supply. There's um, you know, labor costs are, um, you know, they're not really cheap, but they're not very high. And, uh, you know, from that standpoint, uh, you know, Taiwan has attracted in a lot of uh, companies uh, that are interested in, in putting their data here because they see it as being sort of, um, in one sense, it's, it's relative isolation, which is sometimes a detriment, uh, is sometimes an advantage. Okay, thank you, thank you, June. And uh, uh, a few weeks ago, that uh, we noticed a very uh, significant case, and by the EU, and the uh, EU, uh, EU, uh, the court announced that the privacy shield invalidated. And Mike, in your opinion, uh, is there a correlation between the invalidation of the privacy shield and this fast-paced creation of uh, data centers in Asia? Well, that's a great question, and, and I, I, I definitely think that it, it makes sense that there would be a correlation, um, especially also taking into account uh, Paulrick and, and John's comments on, on the other uh, attributes about the, the various countries in Asia that make them uh, ideal places uh, for data centers. Um, but as it relates to transferring the, the data out of the EU, uh, the, the issue is still going to remain that the receiving companies located in these countries are going to have to uh, still certify and show that the data is being protected. And if they're going to do that through the standard contractual clauses, uh, the companies running these data centers uh, are going to have to show that and be responsible for showing uh, that the laws within the countries where they're located um, are, are providing the, the type of protection that, that is needed uh, as it relates to the governmental access to the data. 
Um, and so that really is the major issue uh, with, with the U.S. and as it relates to the, the undoing of, of the privacy shield. So I think as long as, as those uh, companies in those countries can, can do that, then you'll probably see a continued increase in the, in the uh, data centers in those areas. Thank you. Uh, uh, besides the privacy uh, shield, and uh, and actually the the EU court also reviewed the 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 the, 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 the SCC mechanism. And a question to Hosey and Hosey, please tell us how personal data can be transferred to and outside of Hong Kong. Give us a very simple guide. Okay. Well, uh, I think. Similarly to what we, to what we discussed here in in other jurisdictions, and uh, and going back to Mike's point of the of the suitability of the of the jurisdictions, in terms of uh, in terms of what um, of of what needs to happen and what sort of guarantees need to be given for the data to be transferred, I would say that for data to be transferred to outside of Macau once collected here, we have basically two two paths. Like I mentioned, there is no uh, no white list, which means that there are no jurisdictions that are accepted immediately by the regulator as providing the same level of uh, protection. Although uh, from a practical perspective, we know that uh, the PRC and the US have previously been uh, accepted by the regulator as affording the same level of protection. So some degree of precedent, uh, of precedent is there. What I can tell you is that from a practical uh, perspective and what most uh, data processors and data controllers do here in Macau, is they go through the second route, which is a route of consent. If you have informed consent of the data subject, i.e. if the data subject is informed from the outset that, he, that his or her data uh, may be transferred to outside of Macau for any number of reasons and for any number of purposes and categories of recipients with, uh, of which the data subject would also have to be uh, informed, um, in that case, the, uh, the regulator accepts that the transfer may be made to a jurisdiction which would not necessarily afford the same level of protection. All of this is materialized and, su and substantiated in a regulatory process of notification. So uh, data controllers and processors need to notify within eight days of commencement of the collection of data, they need to notify the regulator that they will be doing this and they need to notify them of whether there will be a transfer to outside of Macau and what are the, the target jurisdictions. And if we are talking, and this is a growing concern in these COVID times, if we are, if we are talking about health data or other sensitive data, this notification goes one step further and becomes an authorization. I can tell you that um, at this point in time, there is still a lot of companies and a lot of data processors and controllers who have not made these notifications, but continue to transfer data to outside of Macau. Macau is, um, is, is basically a service-based uh, economy. And, uh, and therefore, a lot of the data comes in here as part of the, of the regional subsidiaries of, uh, of brands and of, and of service providers that are located outside of Macau, which means that the data needs to have the ability, once collected here, to flow outwards uh, to, uh, to go to, to, the, to the parent companies. And this can only be made, and I think that's the key takeaway for, uh, to take from this, uh, from this part of, of the discussion, this can only be made through a regulatory process of notification. And the fines can be quite steep, and they can, in fact, uh, involve the prohibition of collection of data um, or, and, and heavy fines. So I think that's the, the biggest point to consider when transferring data to outside of Macau. Okay, uh, Jose, and uh, uh, to now I want to talk about the data localization issues in China. And um, there's many uh, mountainous companies who are in China. Uh, they consider where to construct a data center in China. I make you a three points and how to consider uh, where to uh, maintain or construct a data center in China. You know, and uh, there's um, a balance between the data localization and the, uh, and the cross border data transfer among the legal regime of China. China actually wish to uh, encourage the free flow of uh, cross border data transfer. Just a few days ago, and, uh, uh, and the countries uh, from ASEAN and from Japan, China, 
and other countries uh, send the treaties of uh, RCEP. In the RCEP text that uh, the countries encourages the free flow of the data transfer, but at the same time, is, and the countries must realize that uh, there's a need for the protect the, the state security and protect the its sovereignty and, and special uh, scenarios. And they may set up the data, data localization requirements. Uh, and China, for some in these scenarios, and they must uh, consider data lo localization. When one business consider to construct a data center in China, and there are three factors must be considered. The first one is the license requirement. In China, to maintain and operate a commercial data center, and the business need to secure a IDC license from the IIT, Ministry of uh, Information Technology. And, but for the self-use, self-use purpose of uh, the data center, and it does not need to have such a license. And so the commercial use of the self-use is uh, the boundary for the license requirements. And the second point is about the um, MLPS, multi-level protection scheme. Uh, if you wish to operate a data center in China, you must fulfill the obligation of M M MLPL. You, you must identify the system and decide the level of the system and uh, engage a third party uh, organization to test, assess the system and uh, rectify the gaps between the system and the legal requirement. Finally, you also need to file record with the uh, Ministry of Public Security. Uh, and certainly, according to Chinese cybersecurity law and other laws, and uh, the operators of data center need to establish the internal security and the data privacy management system. And it is a circuit force for the maintenance of our data center in China. Okay, next question to Pat Rick. And uh, uh, let's, let's remain on this theme. Hong Kong is part of China, but has a different legal system. How does that uh, affect data movement between Hong Kong and mainland China based on your excellent and uh, in depth practical experience? In many ways, Hong Kong's an ideal place in respect of, uh, uh, you know, if you're looking for an Asian center that is also for uh, data sharing or data uh, transfer into China, mainly for the reasons we've already discussed in respect of it being a, a very much ICT enabled uh, location. Uh, it means that in terms of, for instance, uh, latency of transmissions into China, it's a uh, very low, very swift transfer of data. If you look at that, and, and coming com, coming back both to a point that uh, you made, Ji Hong, and, and also that Jose has touched on, uh, is that we are within a particular area within China that is uh, very much being fostered for closer integration. Uh, and one of those areas, I'm speaking here about the Greater Bay Area. Uh, I'm afraid the Greater Bay probably doesn't quite extend to Taiwan. That, that would be probably the greatest bay rather than the Greater Bay, John. Um, and if you look at the level of policy that is directed towards that integration, it, it will also be a, a policy that is directed towards the transfer of data across the Greater Bay Area. And you can see that there would be, in fact, there's been a paper commissioned on this, uh, uh, led by the City, uh, City University of Hong Kong and also sponsored by Microsoft, uh, which looked at the possibility of creating a, a pilot project for the Greater Bay Area about uh, data sharing and uh, the flow of data around the Greater Bay Area on the basis that you wouldn't necessarily be able to argue for a change in respect of national laws uh, in, uh, in China in order to accommodate, but you would be able to do so in respect of a pilot project basis. So if you look at the level of economic activity that is within the Greater Bay Area, you look at Hong Kong's place within that, the various cities within Guangdong province that are part of that, uh, particularly focusing on you know, Shenzhen, which is uh, very much going to be a leader in respect of uh, uh, the ICT world that, that we are uh, in within the Greater Bay Area, and also uh, Macau. So if you look at those three particular locations, there's a big argument to be made at a policy level to break down the barriers for data transfer between those three uh, locations. 
and to foster a data sharing community, probably starting with open data first, commercial data that doesn't include either personal data or uh, important or, or state sensitive kind of data. There is a, a basis where you can create common platforms for sharing that across the greater Bay Area. And through that, there would be you know, data flows, data movement, and greater economic and commercial activity around that uh, uh, movement of data. So in that sense, uh, Hong Kong as part of China is very much uh, got a bright future in respect of uh, being able to uh, transfer data in and out of uh, China. Thank you, um, Patrick. And it, you talked about the great Bay areas. Uh, in my opinion, I think that the free the transfer among uh, Hong Kong and Macau and the uh, Hong Kong and mainland China might be achieved. And, uh, and firstly, and the in the great Bay area. Uh, let's move to uh, Macau again. And uh, Jose, when did our transfer to Macau, what are the limits to commercial use usage of the personal data and the Macau law. We talk about the commercialization. Uh, well, the, there are a number of limitations here. There's a there's a broader limitation in terms of the purpose, the stated purpose of usage of the data that has to be communicated and has to be consented by the data subject. And then, of course, there is in one of the and in keeping with other local with other regional jurisdictions. Then, of course, there is a, a principle of proportionality. So the, the usage of the data cannot jeopardize and, or, and cannot override the, 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 the fundamental rights of the data subject. And then moving downwards from this general scope of uh, uh, protection, we have specific protections, for example, for the usage of, uh, of personal data in direct marketing actions, which requires a, a two-step uh, process where once the data is, has been uh, collected, the data subject should be informed before the first usage of, of, of his or her personal data for direct marketing purposes and should be given again the opportunity to object to this usage. So once they, they go through a first, a first gamut of, uh, of consent, before there is an actual use in, in direct marketing, they should again be given the opportunity to object to this and they should again be informed that this is going to take place. So there are interconnecting tiers of, of restrictions to the commercial usage of personal data here in Macau. Mm, thank you, Jose. And uh, let's move to the uh, US. And uh, as we know that uh, we, we think that as a US legal system is quite complicated because US legal system has two layers. And uh, we need to consider the federal law and also the state law among the state laws, I think the CCPA is a star and it is a, it is a key point for the, for the Chinese business. So Mike, how might the CCPA impact our Chinese business transfer of data into California? That's a great question and, and I appreciate that. And I think that it's an important question given, as you said, uh, the, the layers of, of uh, regulation in the US with both the federal um, which absence really, and then the, the states like California that are really driving this, at least in the United States. And I think the best way to explain it that I can think of is to, is to give a comparison between the GDPR and the CCPA. And that is that with the, the GDPR, for those that are familiar with it, is that if you're a, comp a company that's deemed to be established in the European Union, or European Union or the EEA, um, and and you're working with data subject information from outside of, of the European Union, you're still subject to the GDPR. So for instance, if you've got a data center in Spain and you're, you're contracting out with uh, a company in, in Mexico and you're working with the data subject uh, information from Mexico, you're still subject to the GDPR as the GDPR is written. That is not the case with the CCPA. Uh, the CCPA is specifically geared towards uh, regulating uh, California consumers and California residents information. Um, so what that means is, is that you can have a data center in California that could be uh, established or, or be working in California, but as long as it's not uh, dealing in uh, California residents information, the CCPA is not going to apply. 
So what that means is, is that if you're transferring information into California to, st uh, to store there, um, you're not going to be giving your, uh, the data subjects any more rights than they already had uh, just by, by the process of bringing it into California. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, John, and please, John, and you concrete take away of class who are in the audience now and who will listen and the recording of this uh, webinar later. How can companies reduce risk when operating the within Taiwan? Of course, I mean reduce risk of data. But, uh, we often consider that less is more. I mean, consider cutting back on the kind of data that's being uh, collected to the minimum necessary and planned for it in advance. Uh, getting consent from the data subject as has been a common theme today is, uh, you know, always reduces uh, risks. Uh, there's certain things that you get if, in Taiwan if you have a contractual or quasi-contractual obligation to the individual. But, um, uh, you know, we do realize that there's always stresses between the big data desires to, you know, see if there's another pattern that can be spotted around the corner that can be interpreted and uh, the risk of going beyond the scope and the purpose of collection. And, and from an employment perspective, um, you know, in Taiwan, there were a lot of companies here, um, some American, but especially also, uh, you know, some of the Japanese companies that were, um, you know, keeping information on employee blood types because, uh, or other medical data going beyond what they really need to know if the employees were going to be able to do their job. Uh, partly because, you know, in, in some Japanese companies, there's a belief in a uh, pseudoscience uh, that percolated into uh, the Taiwan mainstream uh, that uh, if your blood type is type A, B, or O, that might indicate something about your personality. And in my case, my wife actually has to lie about her blood type when she applies for a job here. Um, however, the Taiwan PDPA is pretty clear about the uh, collection and use should not exceed the necessary scope for specific purposes and sets out a requirement that this be done in an honest and good faith manner. And one of the funny interactions we've seen going with the U.S. is where sometimes uh, where you have U.S. headquartered companies, uh, you know, their corporate security people will uh, kind of overreach uh, in trying to get information about a departing senior executive. So they'll say like, well, you know, can you turn over your personal computers and drives. We'd like to look through everything, make sure that you're not stealing any any um, trade secrets. Um, and then rather foolishly, they go and they copy everything that's on those drives. Uh, when they do that, that's where they, uh, you know, they get in trouble because uh, you know, oftentimes there's, you know, there's a connection back into Taiwan. The local country manager may have signed off on documents, um, you know, showing that this has been done. And in which case, the company has now found itself not just with some information that evaluates, uh, helps them evaluate whether or not the employee has taken any trade secrets. What they've done is they've trespassed into the area of the employee's personal photos, which can be a very sensitive thing for anyone who's ever, you know, um, you know, been a parent. You know, you you maybe take pictures at the hospital. Uh, you know, when everybody looks at their messiest and worst, and uh, maybe at the beach when you look even more terrible. But uh, a lot of financial data is also very specifically protected. So in that sense, um, you know, we urge companies to be very careful because it's not just a matter of fines. There's potential jail sentences. Uh, one to four years uh, can apply for persons who uh, are in charge of efforts that, you know, that, that go way out of, out of line with what should have been done. Exactly, John. And uh, till now, we have our uh, panelists speak from di different uh, aspects. And uh, mm, I think that uh, we may have uh, some principal guide. And uh, if you are dealing with the business of data in and between Great China and the US, you may you should organize the data flows bearing in mind the following core principle. The first one is consider considering the statutory requirements of data localization. And for some special types of data, if there are data localization requirements, you have no choice. For, for example, in China, for the CIO data, for the financial PII data, for the insurance data, for the credit personal information, 
and health and medical personal information. And also for the important data, you must store the data within China. You should contract a data center in China, how no choice. Uh, the second factor we need to consider is uh, convenience for the, to conduct the cross-border data transfer. I always take Japan as uh, example. As you know, Japan is a country with a adequacy decision from the EU. And also Japan is also a member country of CBPR, of APEC. And so compared with other countries, Japan is with the advantages of the free data transfer among different countries. So uh, the third factor we need to consider the legal system in different jurisdiction. I always think that a reasonable level of protection is a bad choice because the highest legal requirements means the burdens from the, for the data and privacy compliance. A reasonable level is the best choice. Finally, I may also uh, consider in different place where this is available sufficient facilities and infrastructure, it decides the quality of the, uh, of the data center. Uh, this is my thought on the principles for the audience. So Andrew, I will move the time to you. Jihong, Jihong, thank you very much because these are uh, very interesting conclusions after a, a very interesting uh, panel. I must say that I followed uh, the many that we have published so far and, um, and this was fascinating because all of you have shared a blend of uh, real life experience of uh, data protection experts and, and what you face on a daily basis, I understand with your clients and with your authorities. Uh, you have been discussing again and again about issues very important, like consent, like notifications, like the, 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 the need of uh, having contracts that properly state how data transfers in between companies. Um, so again, I mean, this is a strong invitation to whoever is in the audience and whoever will be seeing this webinar uh, once it's published to our platforms, that uh, privacy rules experts are those that can, can really help you out uh, from the strategic perspective, because we have touched on issues related, on, related to um, cross-country uh, relations when it comes to data, uh, two very specific points uh, and very detailed elements of, uh, of data privacy regulations. Uh, I don't know if any of you ha has any uh, conclusive remarks or um, an issue that would like to be debated among the other panelists. Um, we haven't received questions from the from the public, which means that evidently you have been extremely clear. And definitely, these recording will be available uh, very soon on our platforms again. Um, and uh, if there is no uh, additional elements, again, I want to thank you very much. Uh, I wish a very good start of the week for our Asian experts and our Asian public. And definitely, I don't know, Mike, if I have to say an end of the previous week or <laughs> a very early beginning of this week considering the time in the US actually your presence is very appreciated also for that it's not the first time that you're there <laughs> at the wee hours um, so thank you very much again um, to be continued I would say because all of you have demonstrated that uh, the one of data privacy is, um, is a constant developing uh, set of regulations, uh, which is very much needed for every company because every company deals with data in this moment. So we will definitely continue addressing this topic, not only next week um, for privacy rules audiences, we are going to have a Japan focused um, meeting where uh, Jihong will be also present among others. And we will be debating about again, data transfers and cybersecurity and data breaches issues. Um, for Japanese in Asian and wider audience, and in any case on, on our platform. So thank you very much again, everyone.